The New York Times has reported that 50,000 Russian and North Korean soldiers are preparing to launch a large-scale counter-offensive in Russia's Kursk Oblast. According to U.S. officials, Russian troops are carrying out missile strikes on Ukrainian positions in Kursk Oblast and deploying artillery against them, but they have not yet launched a large-scale offensive. Ukrainian officials said they expect a large-scale attack involving North Korean troops in the coming days. North Korean troops are currently training with Russian forces in the west of Kursk Oblast. The New York Times reported that some U.S. military and intelligence officials have become more pessimistic about Ukraine's overall prospects, noting that Russia is steadily gaining ground in both Kursk Oblast and eastern Ukraine. Officials say these setbacks are partly the result of Ukraine's failure to address the critical issue of a shortage of troops. One Western official said that Ukraine's surprise invasion of Kursk Oblast in August had weakened its forces across the battlefield in Ukraine's east, leaving Ukrainian troops vulnerable to a Russian offensive. But the official, as well as several other U.S. officials, said Ukraine still has strong defenses in Kursk Oblast and may be able to retain control over the area they currently hold, at least for a while. Western and Ukrainian officials said that the arrival of North Korean troops was a serious escalation after more than two years of war. According to U.S. officials, North Korea has sent more than 10,000 soldiers to fight alongside Russian forces in Kursk Oblast. These troops are wearing Russian uniforms and have been equipped by Moscow, but are likely to be fighting in their own separate units. Ukrainian officials said that Moscow had supplied North Korean troops with machine guns, sniper rifles, anti-tank missiles, and rocket-propelled grenade launchers. According to U.S. officials, Russia has trained the North Koreans in artillery fire, basic infantry tactics, and most importantly, trench clearing. This indicates that at least some of the North Korean forces will be engaged in frontal attacks on Ukrainian forces' dug-in defenses. A Ukrainian official said that North Korean troops were divided into two groups, an assault group and a support group, which would help secure the territory recaptured from Ukrainian forces. Meanwhile, U.S. officials believe that Ukrainian troops will be difficult to dislodge and that Russian and North Korean forces are likely to suffer heavy losses similar to those Russia has suffered in Ukraine's east. U.S. and British military analysts estimate the current number of Russian troops killed and wounded at an average of more than 1,200 per day. The North Koreans will fight as light infantry without the use of armored vehicles, and the current Ukrainian tactics of artillery shelling and drone attacks have proven devastating for unprotected Russian troops, the New York Times reported. Nevertheless, if Russia gains momentum, it may not stop at its border but try to push Ukrainian troops even farther. According to representatives of the U.S. Department of Defense, it is unclear whether the North Korean government will authorize its troops to conduct long-term operations in Ukraine or whether they are intended only for a counter-offensive in Kursk Oblast. Some U.S. officials believe that North Korea may order its troops to stop at the border while Russian forces advance deeper into Ukraine. U.S. defense officials also said they did not know whether North Korea would send additional reinforcements. According to a senior Ukrainian official, Ukrainian intelligence predicted that North Korea could send up to 100,000 troops. Ukrainian National Guard Reserve Major Oleksiy Hetman says that the pace of Russian offensive actions has increased. The Russian army is advancing up to two kilometers every day. That means the pace of its offensive has increased. The Russians can cut the main road to Kurokov, which we use to provide logistics supplies. If the main logistics routes are cut, there are backup routes, but they go through fields, noted Hetman on Espresso TV. According to a veteran of the Russian-Ukrainian war, weather conditions, particularly rain, can make it difficult to move due to washed-out roads, which is dangerous. Obviously, there is a threat of encirclement of troops around Kurokov, and this is part of the Russians' plans. It is believed that attacking large cities head-on is not a smart tactic. Usually, they try to cover and cut off the logistics so that it is difficult for a military unit in the city to defend itself. The unit may be left without any defense capabilities at all, forcing it to retreat or to be surrounded, added Hetman. Over autumn, large chunks of Ukrainian territory, sometimes including entire cities, have been lost 
on a near daily basis in southern Donetsk Oblast, while Russian forces have also made operationally significant gains near Toretsk, Chasivyar, Kupiansk, as well as on their own soil in Kursk Oblast. The increasing pace of Russia's advance is evidence of how the war of attrition that many officials and analysts in the West had called a stalemate had slowly but surely been flowing in Moscow's favor. With manpower shortage and systemic structural issues at the heart of Ukraine's predicament, the options for Kyiv and its partners to stabilize the front in the face of Russia's acute resource advantages look limited. The most critical sector of the front line, as of early November, is in the southern half of the Ukrainian-controlled part of Donetsk Oblast. After advancing quickly, Beyond Abdiivka toward the key logistical hub of Pokrovsk over summer, Russian forces pivoted south in early September, cutting off a large pocket of Ukrainian-held land west of the Vovcha River with the successful capture of the city of Ukrainsk. Further Russian advances toward Pokrovsk initially slowed over autumn, halted at the gates of the city of Selidov, where the relatively fresh 15th National Guard Brigade took over the defense of the mining city once home to over 22,000 people. Over the next two months, however, instead of storming Selidov, the Russian troops picked away at the fields on either flank, which were both manned by more exhausted Ukrainian brigades plagued by personnel losses. The Kremlin will step up its aggression against Ukraine in the coming months including resuming strikes on energy infrastructure facilities and may also attempt to assassinate the Ukrainian leadership. This statement was made by the former head of the Ukrainian Foreign Ministry, Vadim Pristaiko, whose words are quoted by The Economist. They will try to do something. They will destroy the energy system. They will try to kill the leadership, the former minister said. In his opinion, the next three months will be terrible. Increasing aggression may be a way of negotiating for Russian dictator Vladimir Putin after Donald Trump was elected US president. The publication writes that Trump may be impressed by Putin's style of governance and Ukrainian leader Volodymyr Zelensky may face two possible outcomes, defeat or dead end, since it is unclear how exactly the US president-elect intends to fulfill his promise to quickly end the war in Ukraine given during the election campaign. Journalists admit that even Trump himself may not know what his plan is. The article states that the Ukrainian authorities are working with two options for ending the war voiced by Trump's entourage. The first option is to freeze the war along the current front lines and force Kiev into neutrality. It was voiced by J.D. Vance, whom Trump wants to be his vice president. The second option was voiced by Mike Pompeo, who served as Secretary of State during Trump's first term. This option, as the publication notes, suits Kiev better since it provides for increased military and financial assistance to Ukraine to contain the Kremlin's aggressive intentions and also preserves the prospect of the Ukrainian state joining NATO. Meanwhile, Bloomberg writes, Trump made it clear that he cannot simply push Ukraine to make concessions to Putin without receiving anything in return. The Guardian writes that Trump's rise to power is unpredictable. It is impossible to predict with certainty how the Republican will behave on the issue of the war between Kiev and Moscow. Judging by his previous statements, he may force the warring countries to the negotiating table. There are four points that Russian dictator Vladimir Putin will likely present to Ukraine and Trump as conditions for ending the war. This is the result he can present to his own population as a victory. The Guardian recalled that back in 2022, Putin had already appropriated four Ukrainian regions and Crimea on paper, including those territories that his army did not control. He will probably insist that Ukraine give them back to him, including the regional centers of Kherson and Zaporizhia. Another requirement could be the so-called buffer zone. This is the withdrawal by Ukraine of serious weapons from the borders of the Russian Federation and the occupied territories. The third condition is reparations for the destruction of the occupied Donbass. And the last thing in Ukraine's refusal to join NATO and return to neutral status. All this would be unacceptable for Kiev and the majority of Ukrainians, the article says.